Welcome to the DevReady Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build better tech. Uh, today, we're joined by Stephen Wilson Downey. He's the CEO and founder of Ape Technologies, and they're all about um, automation of WordPress maintenance, effectively, and has been developing some pretty cool tech uh, that enables uh, developers out there in the community to get their WordPress um, systems updated automatically. Stephen, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for and it's bright and early, and all the way from Ireland he's joining us from, and it's 2 a.m. at the time of recording, which is very courageous of you, so thanks again. Yeah, thanks for making that time. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. Uh, two or three coffees later, and it's it's not an issue. <laughs> it's working out. Hopefully tomorrow's okay for you. Oh, yeah. I'll have a nice sleep in now before I uh, begin my day. Uh, <laughs> nothing done if I'm a zombie. <laughs> Brilliant. So in terms of yourself, I um, always love to know a little bit about your background and history and how you got into Ape. So can you tell us a bit about you and um, how Ape came about? Yeah, so about five years ago, um, myself and uh, two co-founders, uh, Dave and Kim, we set up a web development company. And it wasn't too long into the business where we had our biggest customer who had uh, an e-commerce website. And I got a phone call that many business owners would dread. Um, what the hell is going on? I can't process any payments through my website. Um, and that problem took way too long to solve. Uh, Keen was around two to three weeks uh, trawling through uh, thousands of lines of code and essentially what the issue was there was a, a plug-in conflict uh, so it was a WordPress based website with a, a WooCommerce uh, integration so it's the, the, the e-commerce uh, functionality uh, to enable to sell on WordPress websites and there was one uh, component or plugin looking for a comma that was missing in another. Uh, so it was literally looking for a needle in a haystack. And while all that was happening, we had uh, new projects being delayed um, and a really, really angry customer at the other end. And we eventually solved the problem for the website, but we lost the customer uh, naturally. Uh, I mean, if I was in their shoes, I would do the same thing. Uh, so. I asked him, I said, surely there's a way to automate this. And uh, he said, no, there's, I, I'd be using it by now. So um, with a bit of research, uh, found that there wasn't anything out there that would suit our needs. So we decided to go and build it ourselves. That's a big journey. Um, if anyone knows WordPress, there's thousands, even not hundreds of thousands of plugins that exist. Um, you'll have the exact numbers, but um, yes, yeah, yeah. let's work with WordPress. There's so many different developers out in the world. There's millions and millions of sites. I think it's the biggest used CMS, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. And, and one of the most built, the, the, the tech stack that most websites are built in mm -hmm. effectively, statistically. So it is a big undertaking. And if you go to the achieve. developer forums, a lot of the people are disable all your plugins one by one. Turn them on one by one and see which one breaks. <laughs> That's the, uh, exactly. the the existing model of trying to figure out what the hell's going on when something goes wrong. Yeah, uh, and you're right. It, it was a big undertaking. Uh, like WordPress powers around a third of the internet, um, and no two WordPress websites are the exact same. There's always a different plugin mix, and you're trying to figure out how they're all going to work together and play nice with one another. Um, and the, yeah, that was a huge challenge, uh, like with, with comprehending to, to build a data set, uh, of over 55,000 open source plugins and a few thousand more private or closed source, uh, plugins. Um, it was unfeasible and, and, and unrealistic to, to take that approach. It would be colossal. And, how long would it take to construct something like that? So we really had to think outside the box and uh, it, it took us three months just to, to wrap our heads around how we are going to uh, address that problem. Because at the beginning, like I, I, I'm not a coder. I'm, I, my technical knowledge is just the, 
the very tip top of the iceberg. Um, but my understanding of it when we were going to build this was the AI was going to be the really hard part, but that turned out to be the easy part. Um, comprehending, getting that data and um, let alone what to do with it um, was a huge barrier to break through. So the way we went about it was um, we built a crawler uh, that was attached to, to Ape uh, and that would essentially um, interact with the WordPress repository and it was able to uh, determine the old versions um, and fetch the new versions as well. Um, and that was just one area that we had to look at. And then it was the, the server resource usage as well. Uh, having Ape being accessible and frictionless to adopt, um, that was a very, very big objective of ours to fill. Um, because the way we're doing it is you install Ape as a plugin. And if you're doing that, you do want to make sure that um, you're as agnostic as possible in terms of what type of server they're using and what kind of hosting service that they're engaged with also. So that was a, a, a very, very difficult undertaking. Um, and yeah, it took us two years to get to a point where we have something that early adopters could use. It's a, it's a significant piece of work um, and probably one of the most technical projects we've had a conversation with for this podcast. Um, a lot of them are solving getting consumer problems and this is really a, a heavy technical problem that you're solving here. From being a non-technical person, obviously you've got technical co-founders, how have you approached the journey? Um, obviously this journey wouldn't have been smooth, it's a big R&D piece. Um, what does it look like for you? All right, day one took you three months to get your head around maybe how you might approach this, but I'm sure the approach has changed over the time too um, as you had went through new learnings. How have you gone through that process and how have you kept yourself moving forward? Yeah, uh, I suppose it's two things really. Um, number one, it's your team. Um, having the, the, the trust uh to rely on your team to, to to get you there and secondly keeping fuel in the tank i.e money in the bank account um and that was my job uh to go and make sure that there's funding there uh, to facilitate the development and that essentially was how we managed to get there but bootstrapping is is certainly uh, a big part of it. Uh, you're preserving your runway as much as you can. Uh, and for those of you who might not understand what a runway is, it's essentially when you're going to run out of money. Um, and we have a really good infrastructure here in Ireland uh, when it comes to research, development, fundraising. Uh, the Irish government um, through Enterprise Ireland uh, has various supports for um, micro enterprises just starting off at idea stage to to, to really get that step up um, and that's where our first 100k came from yeah that's that's helpful and i think a lot across across the globe and a number of different governments have their own schemes to help businesses in australia we're similar to an r&d tax incentive scheme which basically enables businesses that are really in the startup space um, that are investing heavily probably in pre-revenue to get 45 cents on the dollar back of what they invest into a product so there are a lot of these schemes that people are looking out there but it requires in our in our country anyway yours might be a little bit differently um, in ireland but for us it requires something that's technically novel, challenging, um, that's out of the box, not just building something yeah, that's something been that done before. hasn't been done before and you have to have good mm -hmm. record keeping. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it'd be similar over here. They'd have uh, yeah. quite a rigorous uh, criteria uh, to, to, to qualify. So, you know, you'd have to demonstrate the problem that you're solving and that there is uh, a valid enough market opportunity there uh, before they consider uh, giving you any shape or form of funding. In trying to keep that runway going and you're keeping funds coming in, was that trying to then do web development projects as well as trying to then build this product? So you look... Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. A big part of it. So 
we we registered Ape as, as a, a separate company um, and we have Spera then, our, our, our web development company, and we'd be working away on uh, different web development projects, different design projects and custom software projects. And that enabled us to keep us fed and watered. And the, the, the funding that we had in Ape then was specifically for cloud server costs. Um, and sometimes you'd need some contractors that would have a particular stack of um, programming languages that you need to bring in to, to, to build one or two components of, of what you're doing. Um, and that's how we've managed to preserve the runway as long as we could. Um, and I think if, if you can solve that problem of paying yourself um, it's, it's one of the biggest problems to solve, uh, because let's be realistic, you know, everybody's got to eat. Um, but the, the, the more that you need to draw from the business, the less you're going to get done. Yeah. And we've, we've seen situations where people are taking on like projects or coming up with other avenues to supplement the money that they're not, that they're investing like to keep that runway going, but then that consumes yeah. too much time and then they don't actually work yes. on their product. That's a very fine balancing act, I think, to get, be able to get work on your product and be able to keep the doors open at the same time. Because most people are either going to do one or the other, and the money's going to run out potentially before they even get a chance to build their product properly. Yeah, uh, and, and that's a very valid point, Anthony. It's it's a real balancing act, um, and and I think that the way we approached it was it was was a byproduct of what we were doing, and it was a very healthy overlap because not only were we working on new websites, we were also testing Ape on the new websites we were building as well. Um, and that was a massive part of the debugging process. Um, we had already existing uh, server environments set up as well. And making sure that there's a dedicated person working on Ape uh, at any one time. And that was the, the, the best way to deal with it, you know. When the next version was ready, um, the developers will pass it back on to uh, the sales side of things, so people can drum up more users to 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 adopt and give us feedback and and develop things from there. It's very lucky that overlap exists. A lot of people we've spoken to is I've just got an idea. Let's just dive all in and start working on it. They don't have that business to build it off. Very few people, it's a, a tool that's evolved out of their experiences in that business, I think, Andrea. Yeah, I think it's, it's a rare occurrence, um, but it does make sense if you're in technology, finding a, a problem, um, it is a way to supplement and do it. But I think one of the key things you said was having a dedicated team or person or somebody on the project, I think you can sort of get lost between sucking that resource in and out. Uh, we're in a similar mold, but we've got, we've got a product in the pharmacy sector in Australia, um, and we've been just ramping and building a team for that product only. Um, that product's in probably 20% of the Australian pharmacy market. It's growing, uh, but we've just been supplementing it from our core business, which is similar to development business uh, that we've been operating for a number of years now. I uh, won't bore you with that, but similar challenge where you do need dedicated people, otherwise your resources get sucked into other projects and that product lingers and doesn't actually follow through. So I think that's one of the main things that you said there, dedicated person, still rolling with it and actually putting effort and time into the project. Absolutely. And what, what is your solution for the, the, the pharmacy market? Uh, I come from a, a family of pharmacists. So yeah, so we work with a lot of pharmacy groups and marketing groups. So we help them with install collateral, install marketing, ticketing on shelves, we read data out of point of sale systems, enabling to remove dead stock out of the store, um, put tickets on high JP lines, for example, which is gross product. So if anyone's not listening there, so it basically gives people an ability to sort of automate some of the stuff out of the POS systems because yes. you might run dump a POS report or a point of sale report, but people don't know what to do with it. Um, so getting data in the right order tickets in the right place onto screens also starting to move into that world as well. Um, and just um, into socials and promotions is where we sort of come in. Being able to yeah, run like the, the marketing efforts for the pharmacy. Yeah, it, and that's that's a, a really interesting solution because like m many pharmacists that are qualifying from 
college, especially community pharmacists, the, the first port call is the patient doing what's right for the patient. Correct. And then they have to think about running a business. And, you know, there's, there's many uh, third level uh, courses for a lot of pharmacists out there who would have went to college 20, 30 years ago and uh, they wouldn't have had any business training whatsoever. Uh, so. I think it's like everybody else that goes into a small business because it's the category that they're in, right? Um, yeah. They, they're going to it as an operator, someone doing the stuff in the business. And there's all these other things that support a business. There's sales, there's marketing, there's mm. just the oper daily operations, the finance pieces, and you can't do everything. And how do we automate parts of this will make it more seamless is, is that's what that, that product sits in that space. Um, yeah, so it just helps them and guides them on that end, angle. And we're looking to always continue to automate and deliver more value to them at the same time. That's it. And I think as well, it, it's really important when you're a business owner as well to see how you can make yourself expendable uh, in the business where if anything were to happen or um, you were needing more time to, to, to see what's going on, monitor your KPIs, uh, having that business model get to the point where it's literally running itself and you're just making your tweaks and, and, and keeping it ship shape. Um, I, I think that's that's a point where a lot of business owners uh, should get to. Uh, and like, it's a point I'm trying to get to myself. It's, it's a hard place to get to. It's, very it's hard. not an easy place to get to, but I think not everyone has that goal in business. I think some people go into small business and they just work in the business and it takes you a long time being in business to realize that's not the goal <laughs> the goal yeah. is to create an operation that can run without you and it's automated and it's improved and it's adding bigger value and i think yeah if you're looking at any business especially with the tech stack behind it you're looking to automate these things so it can grow evolve and impact more people um, it's not the you need to do every single rollout on your own. It's how do we scale this? So um, every business should be thinking that way, tech or non-tech. Well, that's my thoughts anyway. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, scalability is key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Technology enables us to do that. With your unique situation, how you had your own business and you had your own safe, effective beta clients, did you find that it was probably difficult to sell the customer, your end clients on what Ape does for them? Because it's not really a problem for them until it's a problem, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I suppose it was um, everybody's familiar with the problem. And, and you'll be right. It's, it's a really boring problem to solve. Um, and the headache only becomes a real headache if something goes wrong. Um, and when we were looking at this, uh, a few months ago, actually, it was, it was nearly this time last year, um, we made the mistake of releasing it to 50 uh, beta testers for free. And that was an absolute nightmare. Trying to chase them down for, for feedback um, was a very, very onerous task. And we made the decision then to say, look, if, if we're going to take this seriously and, and other people are going to take this seriously, we just charge it the way it is right now from the get-go, uh, early adapter package. It's a competitive rate to get to their first dibs on new features and they have the opportunity to mold your product to exactly uh, what they need it to be. And that's an approach that's been really working out so far. We just get the common denominator feedback Per, per person, per business owner. And then we realized that, yeah, this is a feature that is very much so required uh, and will be uh, accepted as a basic in any scenario. Um, and we had to overhaul our user experience and user interface as well. We realized that we built something uh, that looked nice, but was also pretty ugly at the same time. Uh, nobody knew what to do when they installed it or they couldn't figure out, um, number one, they couldn't determine what, uh, what Ape was doing, when it was doing it and how long it was going to be. And, and secondly, what Ape can do. Uh, so that was, uh, 
one of the, the, the bigger learnings of, of the early adopter experience so far. Yeah, so trying to sell their value proposition in a way they understand it, I guess, and what Absolutely. the product can do. Um, I think the important thing that you touched on is when you gave it away for free, the people weren't, mm. they didn't have like the ownership related to it or they weren't taking the lead to give you feedback because they had no investment. Yes. That's, I think, yeah, yeah it stems from that. Yeah. Something for free yeah. doesn't have much value to someone if it's effectively buying insurance. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Once yeah. Yeah, you get the paid customers, I think, yeah, that changes the conversation and then their expectations of you changes as well. Absolutely. And they, they would be very much on point uh, when they're expressing their opinions of, of what they need and how it should be working and how it should look. Um, but yeah, to, to further go in on, on that point and thinking about the value proposition and how we're selling it to people, um, it's essentially just keeping the conversation uh, centered on the problem and listen to how much pain they're experiencing. And I think the last thing you want to do when you're talking to someone is to jump down their throat with, oh, here's my solution. Uh, this is what you should be using. And then spend the next 10 minutes talking about what you're doing. Uh, and it's at that point you've, you've lost the customer because the customer needs to walk themselves through that process and decide that they actually need this and if it's a fit. And if it's not a fit, that's fair enough. You know, if it's not relevant to what they're doing, or I've come across two or three people that really enjoy website maintenance, um, and we laughed over it, uh, you know, like, <laughs> <Enjoy it. laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, uh, as you say, everybody, uh, runs their business, uh, differently and has, uh, different priorities and objectives. Um, but scalability when it, when it comes to that, um, ape is very much, uh, a piece of software that can help web developers get there. And your target market is the web developers. It's not the end client, um, because yes, they can on sell maintenance, but in this way they're on selling maintenance and it's technically automated, <laughs> um, which is very interesting. Um, and it's, it's like the insurance policy too, because you've got security patches. I'm imagining go through this too, or not. Is it just the management of the upgrades of the modules themselves? How does it sort of come together? Yeah. So it, it, it essentially, um, would uh, manage the, the the patching and the updates and and implement them in a safe way. And so, the way it would uh, do it is it would reconstruct the website in its own staging environment, uh, and then implement all the mixes of updates. And it would find the best mix of updates and push the updates to the live website. Um, and whether some plugin versions need to remain where they are or be rolled back to another version, it does all of that to, to figure out, um, how the website could be at its most functional and secure because out of date plugins and out of date components, uh, become backdoors, uh, to, to yeah, they do. yeah, yeah. Especially this whole WordPress world, it's quite easy to have, um, hackers breaking just because of the back doors left open without patching. So it is a big problem in the industry that you're, you're solving here. Um, well, most it, the one people who have a website aren't aware that there's problems or not even aware that they even need to update modules and packages. Exactly. And that's the thing. Like there was a, a security uh, report, uh, it was a WordPress security plugin and they released a report saying that 63% of WordPress websites are breached uh, due to out of date components. And it's a colossal figure. Uh, and it just goes to show how much um, or how many people out there are, are not um, implementing we've those updates. We've done WordPress sites good. and we've been one of those people. We had our site breached a few years ago. I'm just trying to figure out where all these random crap pages were coming from and all this <laughs> other stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Lovely script injections and all that goes with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not fun when it happens, particularly when, you know, it's a customer's website and they're calling you saying, what's going on? And then they're saying, well, I'm paying you a maintenance retainer and website's not being maintained and that brings you into a whole different kettle of fish altogether um yeah it becomes a big challenge for the, the phone call that you're having and you lost the client because of it which is a, a big problem you found for yourselves and then you create a product and i think one of the um 
the big pieces from this is the learning is, yeah, we're trying to solve big problems um, when we're starting anything new. It's, is there a problem? Is there a big issue? And a lot of people find that it's generally around them or their business that they um, design a new product and it's it's a good thing because you've had the learning experience and you understand it um, and you see the impact it could have. So it's a great place to start when you're designing a product to um, just, yeah, focus on the problem. And the other thing you say is, is that a problem worth solving? Well, you, well, you say, Stephen, it's it's a boring problem. It's definitely worth solving. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and th- there's, we're, we're not the only ones uh, aiming to solve this problem. You know, there's, um, other uh, hosting providers that are, are, are trying to wrap their heads, even WordPress themselves are trying to, to wrap their heads around this issue. Um, and that's the thing, it's, it, the, the, the WordPress universe is so diverse and, and fragmented. And when anybody can integrate anything with the content management system, it's, it's gonna to lead into a whole world of problems. Uh, it's, it's a very, very tough one to solve. Um, but it's, it's well worth going after. Uh, I mean, there's one conversation I did have where there was a, a developer and, uh, one, uh, prospect of customer approached him and said, I need, uh, my website updated and the plugins weren't updated for, I'd say around two years and yeah, uh, the, the customer couldn't figure out why. Uh, it was going to cost the same amount of money as a new website to, to, to bring their, their, their WordPress website up to date. And, and that's the danger of it. If you're not on top of your updates, the worse it's going to get. Mm-hmm. It's a compounding yeah, problem. Even as developers, you get surprised with how much work is involved sometimes to do those things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's very much a, a, a hidden problem. You know, uh, there's a lot of customers out there that wouldn't realize that the the website needs to be maintained in the first place and and some wouldn't see the value in it until they've experienced a breach themselves that's what i think it's it's an insurance thing right um and it's a a conversation that the web developers or the developers should be having with their customers but sometimes the customer just thinks it's just a waste of money but yeah once you see the impact it's like anything it's insurance once something happens and it's too late and then you think oh i should have spent the money getting this thing updated um, but yeah that's the reality some people are just not going to take it it's on. like servicing yeah. your car it, it should be treated the same Absolutely. and especially if it's the face of your business then it's even more important than getting that car maintained realistically yeah exactly. like your e-commerce Would customer you drive... i can imagine yeah. two weeks of lost sales for them how much that would have impacted their business Oh, hundred percent. Like, and, and that's it. Like, would you buy, uh, and, and drive a car uh, for five years without changing the tires? You know, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, it's, um, and, and I, I think a lot of, uh, people when they're, uh, getting their website built, they only see the cosmetic side. They don't see what's, what's under the hood, how it all needs to work and the, 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 the work that goes into it, uh, particularly past the design stage. They, they wonder why it's taking so long for the website to uh, reach launch stage, you know? Um, and that's a huge challenge that web developers have to worry about without even thinking about website maintenance. Um, it's a last thing on their mind, isn't it? <laughs> In yeah, general. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so in terms so, of yeah. APE, what's the, what's the vision? What's the plan? Where do you want to see this thing grow to? Because you obviously, um, first product's out, you've got some beta clients and people using it. Um, where, where do you, where do you imagine this being in five years time? Yeah. Uh, really good question. Um, so we have identified a few core, uh, functionalities that people are looking for that don't exist on the marketplace yet. Uh, and that's something we're keeping under the hood right now. Um, but yeah, it's keeping it as, as server agnostic as as possible is definitely, um, one of our top priorities, um, making it available on multiple WordPress marketplaces. Uh, but what we're doing is we're making sure we have more early adopters under our belt to make sure that, yeah, they're not, they're not looking for anything else new. It's. It's ready to be released to the masses and people can confidently download, install the plugin and integrate it into the website, uh, without a hitch. 
Um, but yeah, like we're, we're going into other areas such as automated speed optimization um, and search engine optimization also is, is on the dev path as well. Um, yeah, interesting. So yeah, anything that um, is monotonous and mm -hmm. time consuming and that. yeah, it doesn't mm -hmm. require um, a, a huge amount of complex thought, you know, uh, that they're just long, strenuous, strenuous, simple tasks. Uh, those are the kind of tasks that we'd be looking to automate. Uh, yeah, and I, the speed of optimization makes a lot of sense. If anyone knows anything about a WordPress website, if you had uh, 20, 30 plugins to it, they can get quite <laughs> slow. Um, yeah, so that is another big issue in the space that um, you can automate part of that or all of that, that would be um, quite uh, enjoyed by most of the community, you would imagine. Yeah, not all yeah. developers are created equal, so you get the good ones who know how to write a good plugin versus the ones who learn how to do a hello world one yesterday and you've just released something crap and just bogs everything down yeah exactly uh, and that's that's the risk of releasing uh something to um a, a wider audience and, and doubling down on your sales and marketing too early um because that can be such a distraction fundraising and sales and marketing sometimes can be too much of a focus for a lot of businesses and, and, and I, I get it, you know, you need to, uh, drum up demand and things like that, but your, your reputation and your product offering are, are much more important and, and you need to, to, to get that right from, from step one, you know, your early adopters, they, they know that they're using something that's not finished and they know that their contribution matters. And if it's taking you. Uh, a, a while to, to build in that functionality they really want they, they don't mind because it's already uh, adding value to their website in the first instance so yeah there, there's always this massive rush and this um, hyper consciousness of the competitive environment uh, but when it comes to WordPress particularly it's it's a big enough market uh, there's it's a huge market, isn't it? There's plenty of shear out there, <laughs> plenty yeah, of opportunity. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Um, and the the way we're approaching automated website maintenance is we're approaching it differently. We're we're not doing it from the server level. We're we're going in at the granular level uh, and having it be a part of the website uh, and have it work symbiotically that way. Uh, and I, I think that is is powerful in itself because developers would have different customers that may want to have websites in their own hosting environments and things like that and you know how are they going to be able to deliver their maintenance if um the only way to automate that activity is uh through the one cloud environment or the one dedicated environment um yeah it's not, it makes it less bar bigger barrier to entry doesn't it because then you would migrate everything to one environment so yeah but it makes your challenge a lot harder if you solve it then it's a bigger value proposition for everybody in the community so one of the things that you said that was um yeah quite important there was Yes, we can put a spotlight on ourselves through sales and marketing, but you need to be ready. Uh, you need to ensure your product stands up. Um, if you put the spotlight on too early, you're basically just putting a spotlight on to something that may fall over, and that's the last thing you want. Um, if you if you've had a thousand people on the platform now and said it was ready, what would that look like as a business? How would you maintain support everyone and make sure everything's still seamless? I think um, people want big growth, but they don't understand the implications of big growth. Um, Sometimes you need to be gradually gradual in your growth before you're confident that you can actually 10x this thing in terms of actually your customer base. So yeah, very important point you raised there. Yeah, absolutely. And the, you raised a very good one there as well, Andrew, the having a rock solid support system in place. Um, like that, that's, that's the big challenge with, with, with growth. Uh, even when you do have a good product and, and uh, early on, it means everything. Uh, you never know how the customer is going to interact with your product. And we were completely surprised. There was different uh, customers in different geographic areas, um, having a different comprehension of the, the user experience, how we were wording things. Um, and it needed to be completely overhauled. 
Um, so, you know, we went back to square one. We had to, to go back to the wireframes, the user screens. And the only way we were able to do it really was we took inspiration from smartphones. You, you'd get a brand new smartphone, you power it up for the first time. And what does it do? It walks you through step by step and it educates you what each function does. And I think that was the only way we could really truly address that problem. Yeah, the onboarding yeah, is key for any customer. Any it product. is important, yeah. In terms of, um, and I think you raised another point there is don't expect your product to be perfect day one. Um, no, it's never going to be. It's always going to iterate. And sometimes you do need to scrap and go back and re-engineer and rethink even when you have a customer base. Because to go from the customer base of 100 to 10,000 might be a completely different product in a way you're using it. So you're always rethinking. So, yeah, it's one of exactly. the beautiful things to yeah, hundred percent. And I think if if you're not in the territory of being told uh, how to improve what you're doing, uh, it, it really doesn't matter what uh, age or what maturity your business or your product is. If you're not being told how to improve something, then a you, you you've either lost the customer or b what you're offering isn't relevant to what uh, they need anymore. Um, there, there's always changes in, in, in requirements, um, and, and needs of, of customers and businesses. And I think that's very true of a lot of the big SaaS software offerings that are out there. Um, there, there's one, um, big SaaS company, which will remain nameless within this podcast, but the, the one challenge that they'd experienced and it's one a challenge that is very hard for a, a larger organization to avoid is the manager of the, the developer and the designers becomes the customer and the end customer gets forgotten about in these things. They start building something to, to impress senior management and they're building something that senior management really likes. And then the, the, the customer is completely forgotten about in that process as well. Um, and having that at the core, I think is going to be number one, really important, but also very difficult. I think that's a, a challenge at, at a time where business can, can go through and get sucked in because as soon as you lose contact with your customer, you're in trouble um, because someone underneath you, smaller business will come in and really understand that customer and start solving the problems of today because the problems of yesterday are, are no longer the same problems as today. So they're always evolving, always changing and yeah, we really need to be really in contact with our customer and understand the industry, what they're doing on data basis because it's always moving. Nothing's the same every day. Mm. It, yeah, it keeps the fingers on the pulse because, you know, not only do they tell you what uh, your your product needs to do next, but it, they also uh, tell you s about certain gaps or lack of insights from the competition on the marketplace as well. You know, I have this other piece of software that's not doing this. Can you build this for me, please? You know, and you, you, you literally get into this uh, territory of you're being told what to build. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think an advantage you have, and I've learned that we have a little bit is being in the space of building custom stuff at the beginning, you're in a relationship where you're looking to solve the customers, get understand their needs and, and do everything for them, with them, and continuously evolve the relationship as well as add more value. Uh, when you move into product, and if you're only being in product, sometimes you get lost in focusing on the product and let the customer go. Um, so the advantage I see that you have is you've had that consulting solution um, based mindset, taking that to product is actually a really good thing. If you stick with a, a solution based mindset and still develop a product to support that, you will come from the perspective of this, this product can always evolve and it can morph and it can be different products can evolve based on the customer, um, not just sticking to the one thing you do and do well. So it gives you that flexibility if you're coming from that perspective, I've found it. Anyway. And you're solving problems yeah. for them, giving them outcomes, not like you said, Stephen, the managers or what you think is right. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that's uh, the, 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 the root of, of every business, you know, a business is established to solve the problem for somebody, you know, and problems are changing all the time.
Yeah, which means businesses are probably should be changing all the time as well. Yeah, exactly, yes. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, earlier, Andrew, you, you mentioned a very good point about, you know, perfecting the project too much, uh, product too much and definitely over-engineering is, is a symptom of, of a lot of companies that um, would have a huge focus on tech and a pure focus on products and saying, you know, we're, we're not going to release this to the market until it's ready. Um, but, you know, you, you don't have to release it to the market in a really, really open sense. You can do it in a very, very bottom-up, one-by-one approach where you're literally contacting customer by customer by customer and onboarding them that way um, because you have more control over what offering you're, you're uh, constructing but if something's going wrong um, and they need a, a level of support you, you have the resources at hand because if your early adopters mm. are paying for it and you're getting your pricing right that eventually you're going to be able to, to bring in more resources to help you support those customers. That's an interesting point there because most people want to just put their product on a website and hope that people come and pay for it through marketing, uh, but you can't control the size or scale or who on boards. Um, yeah, so going at it that way does make a lot of sense, especially in the early days. So I think that's anyone listening out there, it's a really good point. I think um, from the perspective of yeah, picking your customers or targeting your customers manually, um, so even though it could be a scalable thing, could be a smart place to start, which it seems like what you've done. So yeah, good point. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the uh, simple act of uploading uh, something and lots of people downloading it, that's uh, that's the, the dream. Fun dream. <laughs> yeah. Whatever I'm 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 yes. Not many people have managed to, to, to live and experience that. Uh, and, and those who, who have, they've been very lucky on the back of the hard work that they've done. Um, but yeah, like in, in terms of, of um, what people are, are, are looking at, and if you're looking at investors now at the moment, everybody seems to be looking for unicorns and, and, and yeah. things like that. But, you know, there's a reason why unicorns are called unicorns. They, they, they don't <laughs> exist. They're not the myth. Very rare, don't exist. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and I think um, there's, particularly with startups, uh, I think it's important to not have that uh, as a goal that you're, you're going to reach that point. Um, I, I think the, the, the way to do it, to me anyway, is just focus on the customers um, because if you've not, no customers, you've got no business. Well said. Stephen, it's well said and it's been a pleasure. I think um, we'll get you back on in a year's time. I'd love to hear how things are tracking at eight. But, we'll learn uh, about your journey. It's been a really, really good conversation in terms of your journey, the philosophy around business and how you're operating eight and um, some really grounded thoughts in terms of how you might uh, focus on a tech startup and, the step-by-step -step approach rather than just putting something out there and hoping people come and buy and then yes if they do can you manage, really manage that are you um, have the ability to support that so i think it's a really grounded approach that you're taking here and a really big problem you're trying to solve too so i think um, yes on the outset people might not understand this as a big problem but if you're in the development space you get that this is a big problem um, and the, the amount of value you could actually add so really enjoyed your story and thus far um, one more question I have for you before you leave. Um, what gets you up at 2 a.m. in the morning to come on a podcast to share your journey? Um, <laughs> <laughs> what excites you? Because I think um, it's, it takes a lot to be a, a startup business founder, and this is one example. Um, so what gets you out of bed to actually come and do something like this and every day to get up and just leave this journey? Uh, yeah, it's uh, for me, it's, it's the people part. Um... I, I just love meeting new people and um, making relationships and yeah, it's waking up in the morning, not knowing who you're going to meet and, and what the day is going to be like. Uh, no two days are the same um, and freedom as well. F freedom to, you know, not have to, to sell from a desk, but get out there uh, and just see uh what other awesome people are out there 
um, and how they're solving problems for their customers in their industries. Um, that's something that just really gives me some buzz. No, brilliant. No, it's been mm -hmm. awesome. Pleasure to meet you as well today. Um, if anyone wants to find out a bit more about APE, um, the website address is getaip.ai. Go check it out. Very cool tech that you're up to. And um, I'm sure uh, if you're looking for some more beta testers, maybe from the, the um, from the listeners out there, you might be able to reach out to yourself, Stephen, and, and um, ask the question if you want to onboard some more. But yeah, we'll uh, yeah, share that the details. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll onboard them at 2 a.m. I don't mind. If it's like <laughs> It's yeah. very, uh, very punctual too and accountable at 2am in the morning. I find that quite fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be getting up at 2am for a podcast, but uh, well done. <laughs> thank oh, you, no, guys, It was an absolute pleasure. Uh, so thank you, uh, Anthony and Andrew. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I wish you a, a, a good afternoon slash evening. Uh, so I'm going to... And you a good night. Go back and enjoy the rest of the morning. <laughs> yes, no enjoy. No, thank you. <laughs> Cheers, mate. All Bye. right, folks. See you. Goodbye.